Hey, everybody. Scott Nicholson with the Judy Nicholson Kidney Cancer Foundation. And we're here with another, our first of 2023, our first kidney cancer conversation. And um, I'm real excited to introduce Meryl Uranga. She was with us at our regional symposium last month, and that's where we connected. Um, and I've just been real excited to get her on to, to share with us her, her story of being diagnosed with cancer and what her what her uh, fight through that disease was like. And, uh, and she has also become a advocate for kidney cancer and is involved with Kidney Can. So we're very excited to have you here today, Meryl. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much for uh, having me here. It's an honor to share my story. Um, thanks for everyone who's joined and will be listening and watching the video later. Um, uh, I have been um, a cancer patient now for five and a half years. Um, I was, just a little background on me, I am um, a mom of four, a new grandmother. Uh, Congratulations. I'm, thank you. I, I have uh, retired two careers. Well, I was a, a DJ and a program director in the radio world in the 80s, um, which has tied in with my lifelong love for music that I still am very much engaged in. And uh, when I started my family, I moved into a career in telecommunications and I retired from uh, Verizon about three years ago when I was going undergoing, or three and a half years ago when I was undergoing treatment. Um, it just seemed like the right time. It was kind of early, but um, I'll probably, I'll get to that a little later in my story, but um, and now I'm so I'm happily retired, also probably busier than I've been in a long time because I'm doing lots of fun things um, that we'll, we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but back in April of 2017, I had um, a bout of appendicitis that led me into an emergency room. I was in a lot of pain and Turned out I had a nearly ruptured appendix, um, <clears throat> which ultimately probably saved my life because at, during that routine abdominal scan for my appendix, um, I was diagnosed with stage four kidney cancer. Um, I say saved my life simply because in all likelihood, had it kept going, my situation would have been a lot more dire. It was pretty dire <laughs> anyway, but it would have been it would have been a lot worse had I not been alerted to that I did not have any symptoms. Unlike some people, I would have had no inkling that anything was wrong with me from a kidney cancer perspective or, or the metastasis that I already had, which was in my lungs and in my brain, I had no idea. So um, I had to go through some acute treatment for the appendix right away. And then I was kind of flipped into a whirlwind of um, decision-making, um, seeing other specialists, seeing a urologist and a uro urologic surgeon and oncology and everything was kind of thrown at me after just having the appendectomy. So it was, it was a bit of a blur. It still is. Um, it was, it was a lot at one time. Um, and I was alone in an emergency room when I got this news. So it was very jarring, very surreal experience. But I, I recovered very quickly from that surgery. Um, that was in April, at like around the third week of April. By mid-May, I was having an aprectomy. Um, at that time, that was the standard of care. Just get rid of the kidney and the tumor first and then look at the rest of the stuff. And since um, my situation was, it turned out to be, I received local treatment for, for everything. I, I went through the nephrectomy, then I immediately, after I recovered, I started to prepare for a lobectomy. They did a bronchoscopy and found that the, the lung um, lesion was RCC. So that was um, determined pretty quickly. And then they were able to um, do a lobectomy. And one week after that, I had a gamma knife treatment 
on my brain. And that was discovered. There's an interesting part of that. Um, I had a CT scan of the brain in the hospital initially when I was first being diagnosed and nothing was there. But the thoracic surgeon who was doing my lobectomy insisted on having a brain MRI. It was just part of his protocol. He was very adamant about it. I said, oh, I already have a CT. There was nothing there. He said, no, we have to do an MRI. And sure enough, there was a small lesion that had to be treated in my brain. Um, mm. So uh, do, as you're, as when you first found out about these, this diagnosis, did you find yourself wanting to seek out a second opinion or did you, what, what was your thought process there? Yeah, that's an excellent question because one of the things that I did want to touch on was that, that whirlwind feeling that I had where I did not want to seek out any information, let alone a second opinion. I was just like, it was very overwhelmed. Yeah, I was very overwhelmed. So unlike my normal personality, which will, which will be revealed as we talk here, I just went through the motions. They sent me to, I met a neurologist in the hospital. He recommended an oncologist that he would, you know, send his own family to, as I remember that was the words that he said. I was like, okay, fine, that's good. I didn't know anything. And then I had my family and friends, very well-meaning, saying, don't Google anything just do what they tell you kind of thing. You don't want to look at these statistics on Google, which mm -hmm. out even more, but they were right. Um, so at the time, that initial, I'm going to say it was about six months, I just went to these appointments. I liked the urologist I met. They recommended me to someone else in their practice who did their more complicated surgeries. Um, so I went with him. Um, if I had to do it all over again, knowing what I know now, that it would have been a very different experience because I would have, like you said, immediately sought other opinions, gone to, this was all in a community hospital, not in an academic center. Mm. I would have done things differently, but I didn't. So that's that's where I landed. So I had the, um, the lobectomy and the gamma knife treatment in July. And then I was considered cancer free at that point. I was, everything was treated um, and they were gonna follow up with scans. I, I remember one of the things that set me off at that point because I was finally recovering mentally and physically. I was getting through all this surgery and all these treatments and I was getting at least somewhat accustomed to the idea that this was my life now and I had to do something about it. And I started getting a lot of energy back, mental and physical. And that was when I found Smart Patients. And Smart Patients really changed my life um, in so many ways. And the number one thing that it did was just wake me up. Um, I realized very quickly that I was in the wrong place. Um, I, I remember one of the first things I read on there was that I should be seeing a, an oncologist that may not be like a super specialist, like we know that they're out there, but at least saw a good amount of kidney cancer in their practice. The, the, the oncologist that I was seeing kept kept referring to this one case because I think honestly think it was the one case he had seen in years. So mm -hmm. I I knew right away um, it was it really was like an awakening kind of feeling like, okay, I, I'm in the wrong place. And I started to get out of the zone of feeling sorry for myself. I was also like very, you know, emotionally and mentally drained and scared and depressed and everything else that you could think of at that time. So it's kind of hard to get the energy mode that I needed at that time. Um, and I was on my own. I, my kids were helping me and stuff, but I didn't have like a designated caretaker or anything. So I had to do that stuff basically on my own. So I quickly found out that at, I'm in Atlanta and at Emory University, um, there were specialists that at minimum were genitourinary specialists that only saw kidney cancer, prostate, um, bladder, et cetera. So that, that got me in. I actually met with one doctor and I, I didn't really click very well with him. And then again, via smart patients, I met someone who was a patient of um, another oncologist at Emory and we we met in real life because we were both here in Atlanta and 
that is Deb Behan, which I'm sure you know of, and she's she's powerhouse of stuff that we do now on the advocacy side, but um, we ended up becoming friendly and she told me about her oncologist, Dr. Lynn, and boom, we just clicked. And that was the little bit for me. I've heard, I've heard similar uh, testimonies uh, from patients and caregivers that got involved with smart patients. So I just wanted to take a moment to point it, that out. I put a link in the chat for anybody who hasn't visited smartpatients.com. Uh, you can you can only uh, access it if you are a patient or a caregiver. So doctors and uh, people that are trying to sell medications and all kinds of stuff that you're not gonna find them on that website. You're just gonna hear from other people that are, that are having uh, similar experiences as you. And, and they don't just cover kidney cancer, it's for all different types of, of uh, diseases. Um, and it's been just a phenomenal resource. Uh, so I encourage everyone to, um, to seek out information there if, if, if you're in need, um, cause it's, it's people just like you that are looking for answers and we can all get to those answers more quickly if we're looking together. And I will say, I found smart patients looking for a support group and it absolutely is a support group in every step of the way, but it's like a support group with a twist because the mentality of people that are seeking information on smart patients it are, and the name kind of gives it away, are people that want to be involved in their own care. They want, they don't want to just be directed um, around by authority figures. They want to be in a in a partnership with their care team, and they want to know what's going on. They want to know about the data. They want to know about trials. They want to know about what's being approved and what's being researched and what's being tested. And it, it's just a, a mentality for people that very much are involved in their own care and in the community. Um, and it also, there's also a tremendous amount of emotional support there from caregivers and patients mm -hmm. because we've all been there and, and know what it's like. So it's a very unique situation. Again, I will always attribute my involvement there with changing the course of my life, honestly. I, I don't know where I would be if I had stuck in the community hospital setting. Um, with, so, you know, the so you immediately noticed a difference from the community hospital setting versus, versus Emory in the academic setting. Um, could, you, could you elaborate on some of the differences? Um, it was mainly the, like I said, I had picked up on the fact that the oncology team I was working with just didn't know a lot about kidney cancer. They didn't know hardly anything. And when I asked about other patients, there was only, it seemed to be only one that they referred to. And I, when I was declared cancer free after the local treatments that I initially had, I was given a prescription for uh, Votriant, which is a TKI and I had no cancer at the time. And mm -hmm. that was what also, I think that's what led me to smart patients as I was Googling, like, should I be taking this? That was not even approved or used in a um, adjuvant setting or a preventative situation. Their student was, which is a, another TKI, but Votrant was not. And so it just Finally, like I said, I was I was waking up and my my spidey sense was like no, so I started looking into what I should be doing, which was active surveillance at the time, um, and it made me realize that the the setting that I was in was just not enough. And when I moved over to Emory and specifically when I met Dr. Bilan, we were we were talking about everything and like he. You know, it was just so noticeably obvious that he was on top of all the research, that he had many, 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 many patients and cases to refer to. Um, and I just felt like, oh, like sigh of relief, like, and, and a bit of regret that I hadn't started there, but um, mainly for surger surgical purposes. Um, Emory has one of the greatest urologic surgeons in the country, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Master. And I look back like... <laughs> You know, because I, I do have a long-term um, impact for my nephrectomy. I, I got a percentage of people get this thing called a flank bulge, which I have. And it's a basically a very large hernia on the side of where my 
incision and my surgery was done and it's very unsightly and it's it's monitored on my scan so it's not particular it could be dangerous if it got like kinked up or something like any hernia but um it's monitored and watched looked after but I always you know have that feeling of what if I had had a better surgeon what if I had gone to Emory first but I didn't well, so uh, you know that's exactly why I'm thankful that you're here today and because I think it's pretty common for when people are blindsided with a diagnosis like this to fall into a state of shock and not know uh, not even the the cor the correct path ain't gonna just materialize. Uh, it's something that we need help finding, and uh, and that's that's why that's why you're here. And I I appreciate that. There's a couple of messages that I want people to take away, and the one of them is absolutely to even if you need help, if you need someone else to do it for you because you're not you're not there yet or whatever, really learn a little bit before you make decisions. Um, don't be bullied into making decisions. You have time. Whatever's been going on with you has been going on for a while. You just know about it now. You have a little bit of time. I remember feeling like panicky, like I got to get this out of me kind of feeling. And mm. and like I said, that's my, my biggest regret. And so I hope that people will take that away from this meeting a, a few, along with a few other things. But um, once I got into that setting, I felt more confident. I still struggled a lot with why me, pity party. Um, I was pretty young. I was, you know, my children were just growing up and I was thinking of all these horrible things. Like I'm not going to be here to see them get married or have children. And I just really felt sorry for myself. And so um, I started coming out of it a little bit around that time when I moved over, but it was still a journey. And I, it's still a journey, but it's gotten a lot better. And one of the main reasons was at that time I started getting involved. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned Deb Behan earlier, and she had already been um, getting involved from on the advocacy side. And she was and continues to this day to be a very aggressive recruiter for advocates, <laughs> for people to work with uh, kidney can to petition Congress. And that's what we do several times a year for research dollars. And so I kind of half-heartedly got involved with that because she kind of forced me into it, to be honest. <laughs> but I loved it. And- um, Glad she did. Yeah. What's that? I'm glad she did force you into it. Yeah. Um, um, another thing that I started to get involved with was um, just meeting people. I went to New York. Um, we had a smart patients like in, in person meeting there. So I got to meet people in person and, you know, learn just, there's nothing like the face to face. Of course, this was all pre pandemic. So we were lucky to get that in. Um, but I continued in terms of my own health, I continued to be cancer free all the way into, well, this was 2018 by this point when I moved my care and all the way until the end of the year. And then there were some things noted that um, looked like it was, you know, coming back um, mainly in, I had had a couple of more very tiny, like millimeter size brain lesions that were treated with SRS, which is very targeted radiation, very simple procedure. No, no, really no more than a scan kind of feeling. Um, I had a total of five of those from 2017 to 2019. Um, and then I started to, there was activity that they noted little small things going on in my abdomen, like in the peritoneal space. And, um, and then it was time to start thinking about systemic treatment. Hmm. Um, and then by that point, with the knowledge and information that I had, Scott, I went and got a second opinion. And I flew to Dallas, Texas, and I met with Dr. Homers. And um, Love it. Yep. And we, we talked about a clinical trial. It was called a Hoosier trial, which was um, 
It was actually Nevo with a what they called salvage IPI, where they would monitor how you did a loan on Nevo, and if needed, they would add the IPI. But because my um, tumors were so 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 small that they I didn't qualify because you had to have a biopsy to get into that trial, and I didn't have one big enough to biopsy, which is kind of good news, bad news. A nice problem to have. Uh, so we went with the standard of care, which was um, I went with the double immunotherapy IPI Nevo. Um, it was very scary because I, um, you know, as most people know, and if you don't know, I'll explain that immunotherapy, while it doesn't have the standard side effects that like a TKI drug or a traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy would have, um, it can overstimulate your immune system. And so the it, they call it adverse effects rather than side effects, but the adverse events or effects of immunotherapy are can be very dangerous. They can be life-threatening, in fact. And so you have to be very astute, very aware, um, very educated on what you're going into and what to look for. Um, it worries me greatly when people are put on this um, combination and they, they come to smart patients all the time and they aren't, you know, I don't think sometimes again, in a, in a setting where they aren't seeing as much of the use of it, they don't prepare the patients enough. Um, like for example, you have to go, if you have to go to an ER or something, there's certain things that they have to know about why, you know, what's going on when you're on that treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so I had that, I did that. Um, I, mean, I, was, I was okay. I had like some rashes and some itching and stuff. And by, after the third, there's four, potentially four IPI treatments. And by the, after the third, I started getting very bad headaches. Um, and I couldn't really get too many answers about it. Uh, some people said it's normal. I called the drug manufacturer, my oncology team, everybody was like, well, like just keep an eye on it. Um, there were just so many different things it could have been. Well, it was, it was so relentless that I started talking about it on smart patients. And anyway, thanks to another smart patient and myself, I went to my, back to my oncology team and said, I think I have this, which was hypophysitis, which is, which is a, it's where the immunotherapy uh, attacks your pituitary gland basically and mm -hmm. shuts down the ability for the pituitary to speak to your adrenal gland. So I was adrenal insufficient and then the, the pituitary gland like atrophies and that's what was causing the headaches. Long story short, did an MRI that day. Uh, it was diagnosed, I was on prednisone immediately and I by the next day I was like a different person. Wow. Completely, but I have been uh, rendered adrenal insufficiency for life, uh, adrenal insufficient for life, that doesn't come back. Um, it's a small price to pay. Um, I could not take any more iffy infusions. That was it for that. Um, so I had three of four, which was pretty good, considering a lot of people get shut down even earlier than that. Um, and then I was- now, How long were you dealing with the headaches? Um, right after the third treatment and before the fourth treatment, which they were like two or three weeks apart. So it was all in that period, but they were very relentless headaches. They weren't like a normal headache at all. So I knew it was related. I just didn't know what for a while. And um, even the, the team didn't know. We were just kind of troubleshooting it. But then I actually called Dr. Homers and told him, and it was a Friday, which you know I kind of didn't expect much, but he said, get an MRI today called my team, got an MRI that day at some remote location that I never went to before and was on prednisone by Saturday morning. My doctor called it into the pharmacy on the weekend. So it was very, oh. everything happened very quickly and the relief was immediate. I'd say within one dose, I was feeling better. Wild. Was, wow. So again, another message that I want to convey is, you know, just keep pounding the pavement when you don't feel good, especially on immunotherapy and especially on a strong immunotherapy combo like that. Um, there's some reason for it. And you just have to really let them know how you feel. Nobody knows how you feel, but you, mm -hmm. and you can't sit on it and you can't um, 
justify it or, and I did for a couple of days even, but not for very long because I really didn't feel good. They were going to send me to a neurologist and everything, but we, we diagnosed it pretty quickly. This was almost five years ago now. So it's like, or four, over four years ago. So it's, you know, there wasn't as much known at the time. So um, there's a lot more now that they would look at that a lot quicker, I believe. So, um, so I went back on, uh, once I went through the high dose steroids, got on a cortisol replacement for my adrenal insufficiency and then carried on with uh, Nevo for quite a while, another three quarters of a year or so, which was, I was fine with that. Um, I was doing well. And, um, and then again, about the summer of 2019, I had a little, little bit of progression again. And Dr. B. Uh, wanted to add the, the TKI at that point. Um, so we went with the Exidnib and Pembrolizumab, which is brand name Enlita and Keytruda combination. It had just recently been FDA approved. The, the numbers from the trials were absolutely sensational looking. Um, and he just thought I needed that extra. He thought the immunotherapy was helping me, uh, but that I, I needed that little extra. So we went with the combo. And I started that in July of 2019, and I am still on it today. That is my second line of treatment and going on, what's now three and a half, going on four years. Um, I had one dose adjustment uh, about a year and a half ago that was just a decision that we made um, based on some very, very minor type stuff that was happening. And it, it was a good decision. And no I, major adverse side effects like the other treatment. I mean, Exidinib is a TKI. So yes, there are side effects. They are manageable. They are variable um, for me. And everyone is so, so different with this. It's, it's a really important point to make that everyone's experience with these drugs is so different. But overall, in a very general way, you can expect some gastrointestinal issues. Um, possibly, I have very sensitive mouth, taste, tongue kind of stuff that goes on. I just have never, even toothpaste bothers me and, and spicy food is completely out. So that kind of stuff. Um, I've had occasional bouts of like problems with my feet, but very, very minor compared to some. And some TKIs are worse than others. Um, I did have initially, um, immediately, immediately within a day of starting it, I had a huge drop in my heart rate and everybody was running around, hold the pills. I mean, it was like, it was, I was monitoring it. It was going into like the thirties when I was sleeping, which is... <laughs> <laughs> almost not alive and so they, <laughs> they held they held the drugs and did a big cardio workup and everything and everything was totally fine so that has just become a side effect for me with this drug like I said almost four years now and I'm I still have it but now I'm so used to it and it's just business as usual it just had that impact on me and I've seen over the years I've seen a couple of people come on to smart patients and also mention it and ask if anybody else has had that so that's just something that hit me. Um, blood pressure is a big thing with TKIs. And again, there's a huge spectrum. Mine is pretty minor. I take a very small dose of a blood pressure medication if I need it. I don't always need it. Um, when I take breaks, sometimes I go back on and my blood pressure will spike again for a while and then it kind of settles. So, but some people have very high blood pressure on TKI and they have to manage it with not even, sometimes even more than one drug. So mm. I can't say enough how you can't really generalize with these things because everybody, it hits different with everybody. Sure. Yeah. So in addition to the, the different treatments, did you find yourself uh, making any lifestyle changes um, that, uh, that you think helped with your, your your um i don't what's the best with your treatment i should say yes i did um i changed so many things um i 
changed my diet quite a bit. At the beginning, I was, when I was freaking out, I was like, I'm going to be a plant-based diet. I'm going to eat all organic. I'm going to, um, you know, I'm just going to deprive myself of everything I like in life. <laughs> and I'm going to, it's going to help with my cancer. And I got over that pretty quickly. That was a phase I went through simply because the best way I can respond to that is that I think that when you feed your body, you also have to feed your soul and you can't take away everything that you enjoy in life. And I like food and drink and, you know, I eat so a I, piece I, of cake. It's okay. Right. <laughs> so. and I, I learned eventually that that's the case and I, I balanced it more, but I did lose a lot of weight um, purposely. I had a I can't tell you how many times I was asked, is, is this on purpose? Because, you know, obviously weight loss in a cancer patient can be alarming. It was 100% on purpose. I worked really hard at it. And more than anything, the biggest change I made was activity. I I got very, very active. I got into a walking group um, and then I started progressing from there. And I've been hiking. I bought a mountain bike uh, this past year. I am very, very committed to physical activity. Um, I think and that's that, not just physical health that that goes to mental health as well. And and I think people don't uh, or they underestimate how how much your mental health uh, benefits your your treatment. Hundred percent, a hundred percent. The endorphins of exercise, the feeling of control that it gives you of like I can do this for myself this is something I can control and to top it all off the cherry on top is that there's a lot of very significant data about the benefits of physical activity in any stage of cancer um, I respectfully understand that there are it really depends on your level of health and your level of the ability but really even if it's chair aerobics you know there's just so many things that you can do to increase your physical and mental health in in during these times and the two things that ha have had the biggest impact this is a good segue into my next topic because the two things that have had the biggest impact on my emotional health are the activity that i do and the advocacy work that i do um and I really want to touch on that because it has made such a huge impact in how I view my future, how I view all of our futures. And again, that feeling of control, like I can do just a little bit, I'm going to do it. And it is just a little bit. It's a drop in the bucket, but I'm going to do it. And as I mentioned earlier, Deb Behan got me kicking and screaming involved in advocacy. It was pre-pandemic. So the very first one that I did was in person, live, in, up on Capitol Hill. It was very scary. Um, and I I have, you know, public speaking background with my radio career and everything. And I was very daunted by being on Capitol Hill and talking to these. Understand most, most of them weren't lawmakers. Most of them were AIDS, young kids and stuff. So once you kind of get that under your belt, you realize that, okay, I can do this. This is not intimidating. We're their constituents. We have something to say, et cetera. So um, it was fun. It was also the last time I went in person because in, I was ready to go back in March of 2020. And we all you know, know what happened. Yeah. Know what happened. But we're still, we're still advocating aggressively. We do a lot of it remotely now. Um, we do. We are going back to like a hybrid situation where some people um, will be going back up to the hill I, this spring, which is exciting. Um, but the reason that that has had such an impact is because getting involved specifically with kidney can has just changed my whole outlook. Um, I really feel like no matter what happens to me, ultimately, I have tried to make a difference. And I'm trying not only with the advocacy work, which I'm passionately involved in, but I'm doing other things with Kidney Can as well. I'm trying to use skills and talents that I have mainly for my media career and volunteering my time and doing whatever I can, like things like this with your foundation, like anything I can to, to help get the word out, maybe grab a few more advocates along the way, <laughs> which I'm going to 
and, and you know making things happen and and you know what we're seeing things happen that's the incredible part um for anyone who doesn't know just briefly in 2016 which is, was the year that before i was diagnosed there was not a single dollar allocated through congress to kidney cancer research through the congressionally directed medical research program, which is where that all lies now. Not not a dollar. We were just the stepchild of cancer. Um, it, it's considered a rare cancer um, and so didn't have the visibility that some do. And, and so we just had last year's funds for 50 million approved. And we're seeing these grants being awarded throughout the country to researchers who are making things happen. And we're gonna, and I, I always like to use the phrase of kicking the can down the road. That's what we're all doing. Um, those of us who are still here, we're just keeping, trying to keep those funds coming, trying to keep the research flowing, seeing things approved. That's another thing. We, I, just in my time of five and a half years, I've seen we've gone from a couple of FDA approved treatments to now what is it 16 i believe wow. and, and shout out to brian lewis and kidney can and all the, the great work y'all are doing that's fantastic it is and so as long as i have the ability to i will continue doing it and please anybody who's interested in getting involved it's very simple kidney can trains you very well and you know i I laughingly explained it. I was nervous about it. There was no reason to be nervous about it. You're very well prepared. You have people with you um, on these calls and it's just an enormously gratifying experience. So reach out to me. Um, somehow we can maybe get my contact info, my email or whatever. Or, and I'd Absolutely. be happy. Um, we'll be happy to share it with our audience. And uh, when we upload that, we'll, we'll be um, uploading. If you missed any portion of this video, we'll be uploading it on Monday. So I'll include uh, your contact information below the video, if that's all right with you. Okay, thank you. And um, that's pretty much it. That's where I am today. I'm, I'm super, super thankful, grateful beyond words that I'm healthy. I am um I, I, other than stage four cancer, I am doing fantastic. I have a lot of energy. Um, I'm enjoying this phase of my life because like I mentioned earlier, I have new grandbabies and I'm working for my daughter-in-law and I'm working for kidney can and I just have, I'm busy and I'm active and I'm extremely thankful and I just want to share, give back as much as I can and would really like to um, continue doing this as long as possible. And, it's, and as the more money that we raise for kidney cancer research, the more likelihood that is to happen. Well said. Uh, so at, the, uh, at this point, I'd like to, I'd love to open this up to questions. Uh, we've, we've got five to 10 minutes here to answer your questions. Um, and uh, I just wanna you reiterate that you can type those into the chat. Uh, Deb had Deb Maskins had mentioned uh, that she ran into the same situation that you did with with smart patients. Um, I believe they had a predecessor website before that, but that helped her navigate to the NIH for the clinical trials, and that she found expertise there on papillary renal cell carcinoma. So she highly recommends it as well. Uh, Deborah Behan is in the audience today. She included her contact information for anyone who's looking to become an advocate. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us, Deb. And uh, I think I may want to get you on here sometime too to, to, to tell your story. Um, Meryl, uh, John asks, have you found any good solutions for sensitive mouth and taste issues? Uh, that's a good question. And unfortunately, not really. Um, I just recently, I haven't even filled the prescription yet, but I was given a prescription for a oral steroid, I, I, the dexamethasone, um, that they wanted me to try on a preventative basis and not just when it flares up because sometimes it's worse than others. Sometimes it's just sensitivity and sometimes it's sores that are really painful. Um, 
So the idea is that taking a very low dose of it regularly may prevent the big outbreak. So stay tuned, John. I will <laughs> I will follow up with that once I try it, but um, I haven't found much other than I switched to children's toothpaste, which has helped. Mm. Toothpaste, you'd be surprised, guys, how toothpaste is really brutal when you have these have this situation. Oh, you wouldn't wow. think um, and unfortunately I can't eat spicy food anymore, which is so sad, but mm. hey, I'll give it up <laughs> for <laughs> the benefits of the TKI. I'll, I'll pass on the hot cheese dip. <laughs> see. The... Um, well, the I think that may be us wrapping up for today, but if anyone does have uh, any additional questions, uh, Meryl, would it be all right if we reach out to you later? Anytime. Fantastic. Um, thank you all, the 12, 13, 14 of us that were on. Deb says thank you. Solange, thank you. Uh, I think we all appreciate it here in your story. It's always great to hear uh, that we're all in this together. It's we're not alone. There's uh there's lots of other people that are going through this too, and there is help there if you seek it out. So, thank you again for having me. And I hope that anybody that has any questions or any more information needed will reach out to me. And also just to say that you know there's a lot of hope here. Um, whatever your situation is, we're just going to keep working at it and hopefully we will all see the fruit of that labor continue and this is how that's going to happen we just have to keep working together and, and making things happen so thank you so much scott for all that you're doing and for having me today i'm happy to do it and uh the pleasure is all mine uh the um Everyone have a great day. Oh, um, we did start um, last night. If anyone missed it, we started a new series uh, with Joel Stern on our website where he's going to be doing an open forum once a month. Uh, it was way, way, way better than I ever anticipated it being. There was just really good conversations and people sharing stories. And, and I encourage you, if you're interested, to join us next month. And you'll also find uh, that uh, Jayla Barnes on our panel, she hosts another open forum for caregivers uh, that is coming up very soon. So you can find those on our website and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thanks again, everybody. Thank Have you. a good day. Bye.